also talked about the word dharma. Now, this is the crucial word because this, is defi- this defines what is equivalent to the word religion in the other traditions. Dharma says we want to make sense of the world that we live in. It does not make any claims about God at all. It's simply saying, let us resolve the human condition. What is this all about? Who are we and how are we linked to the rest of the creation? Making sense of the human condition. We recognize that to be a religious enterprise. Now, in the process, we, if you like, we develop the idea of God. And how does it come about? Let me just touch on it. You see, as human beings, we, we possess certain endearing features that we kind of relate to, we feel very comfortable with. What are these? You see, we all like this idea that we, want, we are thirst for knowledge. What is this all about? We are searching, we are trying to make sense of the world. It is a natural inbuilt thing that we possess, trying to make sense of the world that we live in. It is inbuilt, searching for truth, searching for knowledge. Tremendous thirst for this. The other endearing feature of all human beings is this, if you like, this idea that we like other human beings or we like other things. This, if you like, natural drawing to other living things. It may be our relation, our friends. This compassion seems to flow very naturally from us. We don't know where it comes from. We don't want to even pinpoint why we do it, but it seems to flow very naturally in all of us. And the third aspect to our, uh, uh, to, to our personalities is this idea of being able to control nature around us, be empowered so that we are not buffeted by nature, but we are able to harness nature for our benefit. These three are features that are very visible in every human being. If you try and say, what is the source of, is it just purely a survival technique or what it is? It's difficult to put our finger on it, but we seem to have this tremendous liking for these three features that we all possess. So what we have done as human beings, this is the anthropologic approach to the idea of religion. We use these human features and we exaggerate them. So we say, just as I like this idea of love, compassion, knowledge, power, let me exaggerate these human features and then produce a being called God, who in fact relates to them well. So this God that I am producing, manufacturing, is all-powerful, all-loving, all-compassionate, See, this is, if you like, human attributes we are exaggerating and plonking onto a super personality called God. This is how God became visible, exaggerating the human aspects. It's nice for us to be able to say this because in, a, in, that, in this sense we are not at loggerheads with anthropology, which we, we always say, that, look, religions have a strong cultural, social element to it. And we say, sure it does. It doesn't offend us. We feel comfortable with it. So in the ancient times, the idea of God was simply saying, Do you see these forces of nature, the lightning, the thunder, the rain, the wind, all these forces of nature seem to buffet us. They seem to be overpowering. Let us personify them. So the forces of nature were personified. It's Indra and Agni and Vayu, Varun. So we personify the force of nature and then we started giving them attributes. Now, if I can appease these gods, they will look after me. So I can come to terms with the rest of creation by appeasing this idea of a super personality. So the ancient Vedic scripture will have this idea of appeasing all these gods that we create, saying if we can only get around them, we can have a better harness on our own condition. So we are appeasing these forces of nature, personified them, then we said, look, there are so many of them, so surely we must have one who controls the rest of them. And the idea of Indra was developed. Indra was the god of the gods. And you may say, well, what happened to Vishnu and Shiva? In the Vedic scriptures, Vishnu was just a younger brother of Indra. So he was a little tiddler. Indra was the grand master. And Vishnu was his younger brother. And even the idea of Shiva in the ancient scriptures is Rudra, means he's a kind of a fierce one almost kind of out of control, fierce. This is how he approached, he entered the system. But in the medieval period, these two personalities became much more important in the Hindu tradition. And they became, the, if you like, the main godheads for the Hindu religion. Ideas of Vishnu, Shiva, Mother Goddess appeared later. It is good to see how these ideas developed. Initially, it was forces of nature personified and appeased through worship and through rituals and, and uh, through, uh, you know, hymns, adoration, <coughs> hymns of adoration. This is what the Vedic scripture is all about. This is how we originated. 
But as we developed further, as we went further, we started to have a pantheon of gods, lots of gods and goddesses crowding the scene. And then we gave up the enterprise of trying to make sense of the world and we somehow lost track of what we have, what we have set into motion. This produced tremendous confusion and it continues to confuse the Hindu community as well as the non-Hindu community because they view us as a polytheist religion. Polytheism, so many different gods and goddesses, all of them are almighty and lovely but there are so many of them. And we have never addressed the issue, are we a polytheist religion or is there more to us? Here you see immediately, this is in fact, this has been my crusade if I can use the word in western world. Hinduism was not a polytheist religion, despite all these appearances, it has always been a grand, mature, pluralistic tradition. Recognizing that these are all different ploys for spiritual development, so all of them are ploys in a way to make spiritual you know, progress or become spiritually evolved. So they were, we are using all these ploys to make spiritual progress. And as we are different, the method we will adopt will reflect our own individuality and will be different. Pluralism, not many gods in simple terms, or not many ways for becoming, not many different destinations, but many ways to God, not many gods. This is the mature aspect of pluralism. There can be many different ways for making spiritual progress. This is the broader vision of pluralism. And this is like a nectar-like concept, very suited in the modern age because it removes the idea of strife in the name of religion. The new syllabus coming up in GCSC is now saying, this is a new thing coming up now after a lot of rattling, is going to say religions have to be taught in a manner which will promote community cohesion. Now, one of the kind of key RE, you know, um, personalities, uh, the, the head of divinity, Eaton College, said, gee, how do we do that? This here St. Mark's Gospel, how do we show community cohesion in St. Mark's Gospel? They are struggling. Because they are they are being shoehorned to fulfill a political agenda. But for the Hindus, this comes very naturally. Because we say pluralism, it brings cohesion without any imposition, without having to be an artificial ploy. It is natural for the Hindus. We recognize we can make spiritual progress in a variety of different ways and different religions are using different ploys or different methods to make spiritual progress. Allow that. This is the maturity of pluralism. There can be many pathways for making spiritual progress. Recognize this. So this is the grand prize, if you like, the great thing we are offering modern society of why and how religions can once again become a cohesive force in our society. So this is crucial for us to, 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 to present to the modern society, modern world. So that's one aspect. So please recognize the idea of pluralism. Now you see, when you see all these gods and goddesses in Hindu tradition, you may say, Mr. Dilipai, this sounds a bit worrying because it appears as if we have created them in our own image. Maybe these gods and goddesses are just imaginary, see, because I just said a, these are human ploys. So you can immediately say, but in that case, Vishnu or Shiva, are they just imagination of our mind? We are just creating them as we like? Or is there something more to these ideas of Vishnu and Shiva? So you might immediately be little, get a little rattled by this idea. This is a human ploy, an anthropological aspect. Let me turn it around. You see, you may initially think that because we imagine God to be a Vishnu or a Shiva or a mother goddess, this is purely our mental ploy and God as such does not exist. Maybe not. This is important, very challenging aspect. How do we get around this? The Hindu religion, a unique feature of the religion, is an experiential religion. It does not, it does not emphasize belief system as much as it emphasizes experience, experience of God. Sakshatkar. Belief is the beginning of the spiritual journey, but experience of God is the destination. So the idea is don't believe in God and die. You must experience God here and now. If you're prophet it, so should you. Otherwise, you'll miss the point. It's not just to believe and die and hope to get to go to heaven and see a God. Not in Hindu tradition. The idea is you catch him here while you're alive. Experiential dimension, very crucial. So now suppose imagine a situation. A person is devout, say Vaishnavite. He, he's devoted to the idea of God as Vishnu and he's spending his time in prayers and worship, what is going to be the destination? What's the conclusion of his, all his exercises, his disciplines? 
You see, as he shows tremendous devotion to this idea of God as Vishnu, the Hindus say, a day will come, while he is alive, he will catch sight of Vishnu. Vishnu will come and stand in front of him. They say, but you said Dilipa is imagination, so he's just daydreaming about Vishnu? No. All you do as a devotee is to produce a mold and something fills that mold and that something that fills the mold defies description. Something actually comes and fills up the mold that you produce. The only role you play is to create a mold. You don't create a god, you create a mold. And this thing called God comes and fills it up and stands in front of you. He's much more visible than uh, me seeing you today. It's that dramatic. So it's not just daydreaming that I imagine God as Vishnu and this kind of imagination. It's not the imagination produced the mold. But the thing that fills the mold is very real, very dynamic, very... So when we see the stories of Meera or Tulsi or Tukaram saying they see God, they're able to see God, oh, my, my, my own mentor, Sri Ramakrishna, who just lived about 150 years ago. This man was able to see the mother goddess day and night. And he told very bluntly, look, I see her much more clearly than I see you. You are fuzzy, He's, she's clear, very clear. So it's not just mere daydreaming or imagination, not fuzzy. It is much more dramatic and than my experience of you here and now. Much more dramatic, much more direct. So it's not just daydreaming that you produce a Godhead. That just basically produces a mold which is filled by something dramatic, something dynamic. So God, when, he become, when God becomes a matter of experience, you look at the life of Mira or Tukaram or Narsi Mehta or any of these great saints of Hindu tradition, their lives are transformed. Now this cannot happen by mere daydreaming and conjuring up an image of Vishnu and seeing a fuzzy vision, mm, I can close my ears, I can just about imagine Vishnu. That won't bring about a life-altering experience. When that mold is filled and you come face to face with it, that is the life-altering experience. That is what we are insisting on. See, somebody says, what is the proof of God in Hinduism? Our response is, only proof of God in Hinduism that the Hindus accept is God experience. Not by your prophet, but by you. Until that time, be a very humble agnostic saying, I'm not sure. When you are able to see this God in front of you, you can insist that God is for real. Otherwise, be humble about it. See the breadth of this. If you see the, see the, see the vastness of this religion, it allows you to grow spiritually, allows you to evolve spiritually and relate to the idea of God. Not just it's a belief, but taking a stage further and experiencing God for yourself. This is a nice way of presenting this idea. Suppose there's, a, there's an elderly lady, she likes to think of God as Krishna and she's devoted her life to Krishna. She loves the idea of little baby Krishna and she's devoted. And these are, there are examples in recent times where this kind of people have experienced God firsthand. It has been life-altering for them. So you know this is not, a, not a, some kind of imaginary process. Something seriously happens. So when this lady, for example, devoted the idea of Lord Krishna as a baby Krishna, and suddenly while she's singing, singing the glories of Krishna, and suddenly Krishna comes as a grown-up man, you know, Harry just, hello, I'm here. She said, go away, didn't ask for you. I wanted a baby Krishna to play with. So you see, the mole is the one that she produces. And this thing, I'm using the word thing in a very loose manner, that fills the mole is pure spirit. It fills the mole and comes and plays, and comes in front of us and we inter allow us to interact directly with God here and now. <clears throat> because in the Abrahamic tradition, they say you cannot see God, this idea is completely lost. They say, God can, you, you, you are a creepy crawly, there's no way you can perceive God. And the Hindu say, no, you are the chip of the old block. You can see God, experience God for yourself, because you are, if you like, a spark of God. So you can appreciate his ca caliber, you are of the same caliber. So you can experience God firsthand. It allows that. See the idea, really I'm becoming alive here and now, not in the hereafter when you die, be goody goody and when you die things work out. No, doubt it. Here we need this resolution here and now. So this idea of this idea of Godhead as personality, unapologetic idea of Hinduism, not saying, oh, you know, maybe and please bear with us, we like to think God like this. No, we say God actually fills the mold and comes in front of you. And we have examples of personalities who have seen or who experienced God in this particular manner in recent times, in modern times, not just ancient times. So we fall back on that. 
So all these, if you like, the variety of different ways Hindus relate to the idea of God as Vishnu, Shiva, Mother Goddess, Hanuman. You see, every child, everybody will have their own unique approach. And if you like, a unique liking for a particular form of God. Don't be apologetic. Again, this issue arises, are you idolatrous? You are worshipping idols. And Hindus say, we never worship, you know, we never go and worship objects and images. We are actually worshipping. Criticism leveled at Hinduism, mainly from the Abrahamic tradition, is this, that you are idolatrous. This has been a major criticism. In fact, look, let me tell you, my experience of taking Hinduism to the non-Hindus makes this very visible to me. I get this all the time. You see, this has been a really sad situation. Most other people of other religions have been told, presented, have been given such a poor presentation of Hinduism, they don't think we have got any validity at all. At one temple, one lady jumped up and said, but you drink cow's urine, don't you? I said, oh, and you burn your widows. I said, oh, yeah, much more than that. Have you seen any woman being dragged in the crematorium, being burnt alive or something, or we are selling cows urine in the temple shops or something. Why are you talking things like that? Because the only way they have been presented Hinduism is in this poor light. See, this is a serious thing that we have to watch out ourselves. You cannot, your candle, this is a nice saying, your candle will not burn any brighter if you blow away somebody else's candle. It will just burn at the same strength. So this idea of comparing the best of mine with the worst of others has been a ploy used by many to promote their own religion. In fact, there are certain channels on sky who are devoted to this practice. Forget about teaching what good they have, they want to show how bad others are. It's so easy to do text torturing and show another religion a poor light. So I can do it or you, anybody can do it. And this has been a major enterprise because there's nothing much that I can sell for myself. Let me show others in a poor light. Yes, it won't work in modern time. But this is very visible. So, it is so necessary to address some of these issues that arise in the name of Hinduism, like idolatry. You are worshipping objects, that's what they are telling us. Hindus do not worship objects, they use objects to think of the infinite God. And they are not apologetic about it. Let me use two words that you can pick up. The word pratima, derived from the Sanskrit root prati, means going towards. Pratima means says, that the image that will lead me to God, that's what it literally means. So it's very, very clear, we're using this image in order to lead me to God. So pratima is, if you like, the intermediary that will lead me to God, pratima. Even the word murti that we use is derived from Sanskrit from, if you like, from matter. So using material expression of spirituality, that's what it literally means. Using matter to give expression to spirituality, so murti materialized form of spirituality. So we, are, we recognize that we use these objects in order to relate to this idea of the spirit, this infinite being through a finite form. And we are not apologetic about it at all. Again, don't be apologetic. Why should we lie, you know, shudder and say, oh dear, other people will think so badly of us. This is the way we do things. Everybody will use some imagery, some finite imaginary to relate to the infinite. They do it in mathematics all the time. When you want infinity, they'll do a little squiggle, say, oh, that's infinite. That's not infinite, that's number eight that's fallen down. Oh no, that's infinite. See? Finite tools to relate to the infinite. Visible in every field, so why not in religion too? Recognize this. The moment you present Hinduism in this format, you see, we are no longer now apologetic about thinking about God with form and giving God this variety of different forms. We are not apologetic. This is how different Hindus relate to the idea of the spirit. This is how we relate to it. This is how we continue to build relationship with it. We show adoration to this idea of God with form, of this form, or that form. We find it endearing. Because what are we doing is this. I'm looking at the deeper ploy. By thinking of God in this kind of super manner, what we do is this. Have you noticed? And then we are trying to build relationship with God. Variety of relationships. In the process, this thing that is inside us, this love, this compassion, this love of knowledge, becomes enhanced, you see, because now I'm relating to the infinite God, infinitely wise, infinitely, you know, um, um, powerful, infinitely loving. So I have to raise my level to reach him. That's how I build relationship with this infinite God. So in that sense, I'm breaking away from my finite bones and becoming infinite myself. This is the exercise. This is the discipline of religion. It makes you a spiritual being. It charges you up. 
it raises your level. So what was the endearing features of human, you, you, human beings become, if you like, now more clearly visible in our lives. This is becoming religious, putting religion into practice. So by, by adoring an infinite God, all-powerful, all-knowing, all-compassionate, by building relationship with him, I have to reflect the same qualities, surely. Thereby, I invoke the spirit in me. I become like him. So when you see a devout Hindu, he will reflect that idea of compassion which is universal. Unless that is visible, he is not succeeded. He just theorized about religion, but he has not put religion, religion into practice. So you see this idea of, idea of expanding our idea, ex expanding what we, these endearing features of, a, of human beings to be raised to that level whereby we can relate to the infinite God. Just wait for You see, this idea of presenting religion in this broad manner is so crucial in a rounded, wholesome manner. So different things that we appear as if they don't fit together begin to fit together. So this idea of using these human features we possess to become even more humane. You see, this the enterprise of religion is this. Becoming not just human being, but becoming more humane. This marvelous thing that we possess, this compassion, let it flow even more, more smoothly. That is what religion is about. This love for knowledge, this compassion that we have, you know, this, this, all this thing, let it flourish. When you tell this is the enterprise of religion, people say, wow, this, is, this makes so, such a sensible enterprise. When you say, no, you have to believe in a god and crack a coconut and go in temple and tinkle bell, that's how. Oh. We say, no, we want you to become a better human being. Don't you think, don't you like these things about power and knowledge and th thirst for knowledge? Don't you? Yes. That's what we're asking you to do. Become more knowledgeable. Become more compassionate. Become more powerful. So you are in charge of your own position, your condition in this life. Become like that. This is what religion is about. This is the real meaning of the word religion in the Hindu tradition. Very unusual aspect, unusual way of looking at it. So we progressed, but then you see, I have brought in this idea, there's something, I use the word thing, fills the mold that you produce. I love God as a personality. I love God as a mother goddess. So I've got this image, okay, I've got, she has got six arms, maybe eight arms, depending on which mother, I, mother, mother goddess I go for. When I have that mold, it will be filled. What fills it? What is the thing that fills all these different molds? Now we come across the most comprehensive definition of the word God in the Hindu religion. And that word is Brahman. From the Sanskrit root Braha, cosmic. We are saying there is a principle, look, watch out, principle that underpins this world and that principle is not some lump of matter, not even energy, that principle, not even energy, that principle that underpins everything, we are calling Brahman, cosmic principle. And do you, do you think that I'm just generating, making it up? The Hindu religion has always been called Apurusheya. What, by, what, is, what is meant by the word is that actually it is not personality related, it is a principle related religion. Why is it important? Suppose a religion is based on just one personality. Suppose Christianity is based on the teachings of Christ. And tomorrow you prove that Christ was not a historic figure. He was made up, let's say. And there is a whole lobby trying to do that. Whole of Christianity will crumble because it's based on a personality. This religion that we come from says, no, no, it's not. Per so if you tomorrow prove that Krishna didn't exist, well, religion carries on. It's a principle-based religion, not a personality-based. So, a purusheya. I'm not saying the personalities are any less important. I'm simply saying it is talking of a much deeper idea which is principle-based. And we hear this word Brahman, principle-based religion. Braha, cosmic principle. Now for the next few sentences, flow with me without arguing. This thing called Brahman manifests or the tricky word is appears as the universe in front of us. The universe is called Shrishti, which means a projection. So it's not a reality, it's a projection, it's an appearance, it's a manifestation. These are the three words I use. So the universe is a manifestation of some principle that becomes visible as all this thing around us, galaxies, stars, moons, everything. It appears visible like that. And in the visible world, wherever you see a living thing, 
that principle is becoming more clearly visible. So there is a hierarchy in the world that you experience. You got this non-living thing, lumps of matter around us, and within the lumps of matter you get some lumps of matter getting, getting wound up and expressing something more than a lump of matter, a living thing. And this living thing we say is the spirit winding up matter and becoming itself, becoming more clearly visible, manifesting, becoming more clearly visible as living thing. And whenever you see a human being, the spirit has become fully visible. It is most transparent manifestation of Brahman as men and women, as human beings. This is the conclusion of this religion. You're making, so you wanted to make sense of the world? And we are telling you, the way you make sense of the world is to recognize the essential nature of reality. There's something dramatically different from matter that underpins the world. It manifests as matter, becomes more visible as, as living thing, and clearest as men and women. This is our conclusion. So we are saying that human beings reflect something grand that underpins everything. And the way we, we can give expression to this idea is, we say our essential nature of every living thing and every human being, our essential nature, be careful of the word, essential nature is the spirit and not the body or the mind. It's not material, it's not mental, it's not intellectual. It is something that we define as the spirit. And this kind of individualized expression of the spirit we call Atman. Our essential nature is the spirit, is the definition of the word Atman. So I've introduced you, I've given you two important words of the Hindu tradition. Most Hindus struggle with this. In fact, they would bypass this word without giving any expression. If you look at the glossaries of every textbook, you'll see at the back, look at the definition of Brahman and Atman. You see the caliber of the book. One or two books I said, it's a, a universal force. Force is matter, matter and energy are linked, this materialistic fellow, that's not what it is, not a force even. It is something dramatically different from matter and force. It is something dramatically different, dramatically different from the intellect that you possess, which is so sharp, which allows us to have such a good insight into nature of reality. But this thing called spirit is much deeper, much more sharper than our intellectual powers. That we call Brahman. That's the most comprehensive definition of the word God in the Hindu religion. The thing that underpins the whole of this reality becomes visible as this reality and more visible as living things. So now we see what we have done is this. Why is this particular approach so crucial? Because it gives the foundation of, the mo of, the, of, of, of morality in the Hindu religion. It gives the very solid foundation. Let me explain why. There are two ways you can look at why we should look after each other, why should we not thump each other. There are two, re two ways you can approach. One approach would be say, you see we are talking about this Vishnu or idea of this God, super God, this uh, mother goddess who created everybody including me and you and she is looking over my shoulder saying, watch it my boy, if you mess up with these other people and you hurt them, I am watching you, I will catch you and thump you. This is one approach. She is looking over my shoulder or she is looking over my shoulder and keeping record. This is one way of making us moral because somebody is watching over us and keeping records. This is a, it may work. You see, for majority of people, this is good enough. They don't want to think any higher. But this esoteric Hindus may just given about ideas of Atman and Brahman. It gives you a different angle to the whole issue of morality. It gives you a much more solid foundation for morality. Why should you not follow them? Because it says you are stuck with them. The same thing that I call spirit becomes bubbles up here and becomes visible through my eyes. The same thing becomes visible in his eyes or in her eyes. The same thing, sparkling, bubbling up, becoming visible here, there and everywhere. So I am linked to the rest of the creation at the deeper spiritual level. So when I hurt somebody, in effect I am hurting myself. When I help somebody, I am not doing anything special, I am helping myself. Even you can't use the word charity. Because that's a demeaning comment. Who, who are you to do charity? You are linked with the rest of creation. You are stuck with them. You have no choice in the matter. If at all you present Hinduism in this, this esoteric mode, or where is the foundation of morality and ethics? Why should we help each other? Why should we not hurt each other? Then these ideas of Atman and Brahman are the best ways. If you like the most direct reason why we have to be ethical or moral. 
You see how endearing, how lovely this idea is. I'm taking you on, this, on, 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 the, on the flight of Hinduism, showing you why. Ideas of gods and goddesses are marvelous, but this idea of Atman and Brahman are esoterically very thrilling, very exciting. And this is how, in fact, in modern times, we will find that youth will relate to the idea of religion much more easily when you present it in this format. It almost sounds like humanism, because we are dignifying humanity. But it's much more than the normal humanist tradition. We say that we have to behave with each other because we're all human beings and we share the same issues, so let us work together well, so we look after each other. But then it says, why should we work for each other? This is because this is a lump of matter that got wound up in this lovely manner, and this is another lump of matter that got wound up, and we've got some kind of duty towards each other. Otherwise, we'll thump each other, so let's learn to live with each other. For the Hindu, this is not good enough. They say the reason why we look after another person is not because also a lump of matter, but at a deeper level, we are linked to each other. This is called spiritual humanism, not materialistic humanism, but spiritual humanism. This is the difference between Hindu humanism and the Richard Dawkins version of materialistic humanism. And I guarantee you, every youth that I have come across prefer the spiritual humanism. They say we are more than matter, we are not just a lump of carbon, there's more to us. We all know it, intuitively we know it, inside of us we know there's something special about us, we don't know what. But this idea of Atman and Brahman bring it to the fore, they bring it, make it alive, very crucial. You talked about um, the, the spirit rising up in the, in the moulds. Um, how, how do you explain um, this almost kind of bargaining that often happens in our region, where you say to God, um, if this happens, um, I will do X, Y, and Z. You know, if we're talking about it being an experience and a devotion that will eventually manifest, its, manifest itself in God um, being shown to us on an individual level, um, it seems to me that we, we tend to move more towards that bargaining where if this happens to me, I will go to the temple, I will do fasting. Um, how do you balance the, the two views? Marvelous. Okay. You see, what you recover and I just pointed out, are, there are two kinds of devotees. That's what you pointed out. The first kind of devotee says, look, God, I want to do business with you, commerce. You know, I'm having difficulty health-wise, wealth-wise, you know, family-wise. We all have all sorts of difficulties. So look, God, if you sort me out, I will repay you somehow. I'll send $100,000 if I win the lottery for a million, $100,000 I donate. So you start bargaining with God. Now, these are one kind of devotees. And this Lord in the Bhagavad Gita says, Krishna says, okay, this is what you to do, do business with me, I'll do business with you. It allows artharthi, they're called artharthi. But the second kind of devotee that Krishna, or if you like the idea of, uh, if you like the higher form of devotees, that is visible in the Bhagavad Gita, says, the devotees that I truly love are not those who are just pull my chain when there is an emergency, you know, like in the train you got an emergency chain, where you pull in times of emergency, you pull the chain and the train stops and things are sorted out. So these are the first kind of devotees. When things go wrong in their life or they are needing, you know, some more money or this and that, they say, oh God, let's negotiate. These are one kind, they are allowed, in Hindu tradition allows them. They say, fair enough, this is one way of approaching the idea of religion. You are doing business with God. Let, rather than do business with other people, might as well do business with God. Allows for it. But the second form of devotee that I'm talking about, the higher form of devotee called Parabhakta, is the one say, I don't want any business with you. I want you full stop. These are the higher devotees. So they are not negotiating. So you say, how do you reconcile the two ways? I said, the way we reconcile is there are two forms of devotees. The one who are saying, this world is good enough for me, just improve a little bit, tweak it a little bit, I'm happy as things are. You, I, you can wait, I'll catch you later on. So these are the first devotees, form of devotees. For them, this idea of filling up the mold is not important. Just sort out, give me lottery money, that's enough for me, Lord. I'll sketch you later on. You know, so I'll, I'll, you know, we'll give you a rain check, so I'll catch you later on. So they, these are the first kind of devotees. The second one who are really more devout, who are not going to take a second best, they want the first. They say, look, we want, if you are for real, God, if there is something more to this world, underpinning this, this thing called spirit, it becomes manifest in the human form and come in, comes and plays with us. If you can do that, I wish to experience that. That must be the most thrilling experience. Winning the lottery, getting married to that man or that woman, or that's fair enough, but this is going to be the most grand prize of this life. I want the grand prize, nothing less will do. 
So for him, God fills the mold. For the first one, God may just do a bit of more negotiating. We don't know how he operates. But this is, if you like, there are two different devout devotees that you kind of hi highlighted. So the first one, God filling up the mold is not crucial. The second one, nothing less will do. In fact, the Gayatri that we just recited, the unique feature about the Gayatri, see, again, it immediately shows the two different kinds of de de devotees. The Gayatri does not ask anything from God, but asks for God. Look at the power, of, that's why it's a potent prayer. He says, you see, and this is a clever ploy, do you know, because if you catch hold of God, then all your desires will be fulfilled automatically. I mean, suppose you're catching hold of the mother goddess, you know, you're holding her finger. Do you think any desire that you will not be fulfilled? You are hanging on to God. So the second prayer is much more potent. I'm just making sure that the commercial element is also taken care of. Once you catch God, then everything else will follow. So every other desire you might have had will be fulfilled because you caught all of the, 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 center, the cornerstone, the, the central idea. So the idea of God experience is crucial. Once you get that, the rest will, doesn't matter. Then you see the thing is this. This is what actually happens. Once you catch hold of God, and the only way you can catch hold of God is to raise yourself to the level of God. You, because that is what your real nature is. So when you raise your own level to the level of God, then you have God experience. Or God experience will elevate you to the level of God, if I put it that way. But at that level, you see, when you feel that you are God, do you think any other desires will ever trouble you? They fall away. Desires for material wealth, name, fame, appear so poor, they will not come anywhere near you. If you look at the lives of some of these great, great, you know, the mystics, the great uh, bhaktas of the Hindu tradition, you see that very visibly. Nothing but God will do for them. Do you think they are bothered about getting their picture in the newspaper or getting on Asta TV? Couldn't be bothered. Their love is God and nothing else will matter. Once you touch the feet of God, what else can ever attract you? That means that God is not good enough then. Something goes wrong with him. It must be that dramatic that desires fall away. They cannot touch you anymore. And my mentor Swami Vivekananda was like that. You see, when he used to walk, people used to comment, I love these words and I repeat them again and again and let them go and ask again and again. He says, when this man was walking around, he walked as if he owned the world. He was the grand master of the whole universe. He walked like that and yet desired nothing from it. This is how a real master operates. Otherwise you are a pauper, otherwise you are still a beggar. You see, have you seen that in, in the Hindu tradition they do the stories of the, of the king of the country putting on a kind of um, a, a disguise and going into this kingdom and wandering around as a beggar sometimes to see how his kingdom is operating. But you can see, He's not at any stage, he doesn't feel at all compromised because he's wearing the beggar's uniform. Because he knows he's the master of the universe. So he still goes around, watches the whole world, and yet he feels absolutely masterful, never feels compromised that he's turned into a beggar. In the same way, the Hindu tradition says that really, you are, why by begging, saying, oh God, do this for me, do this, you are really de de you know, de um, degrading yourself. Lift yourself up, you are the chip of the whole block. Why should any desires cloud your vision. You are chip of, the go chip of the old block. You are that. But this is one thing to say, assert. <clears throat> it's not a clever thing to say. But another thing to actually experience. And religion is this idea that you don't just believe in things. That's what I told you. You must experience that. If I say I'm the chip of the old, I should actually experience that in my own life. It should be visible in my own life. I should live like that. And this is what religion makes us do. It gives us tremendous dignity. It lifts us up. Uh, in your talk, at least, you gave, at least, uh, there are two things I need sort of further clarification, please. I think uh, when you mentioned our gods, at least, you made references to Lord Vishnu and uh, Shiva, but did not actually bring in Brahma. Now, obviously, a lot of the Hindus actually think of the Holy Trinity, Hindu version of the Trinity, so please actually sort of see where they come in. And the other thing is actually that Hinduism, actually, we are actually based on experiences. Now, you give examples again of Tukaram, Mira, all that, actually, they have achieved that experience, but majority of us do not. Now, actually, where is that missing factor, at least, okay. for us to at least gain or at least be part of that experience? Marvelous. Thank you. Let me tackle the first question. This idea of a trinity in the Hindu tradition, the idea of God as the creator, preserver, and the destroyer. Now, majority of people that I come across, majority, I say not all, 
are Vaishnavites. They like the idea of God as a super personality called Vishnu and the various avatars of Vishnu. Marvelous idea. But I also come across lots of Tamil youngsters who are Shaivites by tradition. Their Godhead is Shiva. And they say, Mr. Lakhani, this is sad because they are saying Brahma creates, Vishnu looks after, and our chap goes and knocks everything down. He's given such a poor role to fulfill. It's not fair to us. I say, yo, it's not fair. Actually, it's not fair. So in the new syllabus in Edexcel, I said, look, this idea of Trimurti is more suited to the Vaishnavite tradition and less suited to the Shaivite tradition. And they listen to me. I think they're going to change it now. So if you look at the, you see, look at the Shaiva tradition. He said, this God that we talk about must be the creator, the preserver, and the destroyer, all combined. He must fulfill all the roles. This is what God is. He does everything, not separated out. So our Shiva is that. I say, are you just making it up? No, no. The most, kind of, the, the most important imagery of Shiva will be visible in almost all homes. Whenever this Hinduism, that image will appear. Do you know what's that image? Shiva is Nataraj. Have you seen the image of Shiva as Nataraj? Every home, you know, there's a circle of fire and Shiva standing and it's the Lord of the Dance. Now, what does that depict? depict? I'll just show you Brahma, Vishnu, Shiva combined in one as Shiva. In that image, look at the imagery. The imagery will in a way reflect the role this idea of God is going to play in society or for, for, for mankind. In one hand, Shiva holds a drum. They say the beating of this drum, you know, this sound that comes out, will produce the whole creation. Image of creation, Shiva, using the drum to, for creation, Namru. In the other hand, he holds fire, symbol of destruction. So Shiva creates and Shiva destroys. One man, not Brahma anymore, in the Vishnu, in the Shiva tradition. Shiva creates, Shiva destroys. With the other two hands, again it's important, look at the imagery. If you look at the image of Shiva, with one hand is pointing towards his own foot. It is saying, in order for you to, the second question that you ask, how can we become experiential Hindus? We want not only believe in God, we want to experience God ourselves. Where is the, if you like, where is it? Why are we struggling? This is what he, this, this gentleman asked. And the her, third hand of Shiva in a way points out the answer. He said, don't you realize, grace is required. And the name Shiva actually means not only God as a personality, but as grace of God. This is what it actually literally means. So the, for the second part of the question, again comes from the Tamil, if you like the Shiva tradition saying, you have to, there is some click, we need, some, as, if, as if there is something that we are still cannot achieve by our own effort, we need God to give us a hand, lift us up. So Shiva points at his own foot saying, come my friend, come to me. I am grace rolled up. God and God's grace rolled up in one. Shiva means that, grace. So he said, by just coming close to me, you not, don't only really get God, you get God's grace. It comes as a buy one, get one free. <laughs> so the Shiva tradition will bring this idea, God, God and God's grace must come together. So this is the idea. And with the fourth hand, look at the power of this imagery. The fourth hand of Shiva goes like that. Abhaya Mudra. You see one thing, we were trying to resolve the human condition, weren't we? We want to resolve the human condition. What are we? What are we doing here? What are, you know, one thing that keeps bothering us, keeps overwhelming us. You know what it is? If somebody, if there was a big, you know, um, kind of bang outside the room, we'll all go. If there was a big bang, loud clap outside, we'll all go. Oh, bomb. Oh, somebody sh firing. We'll all go. Shudder. All of us stuck with this fear. You see, even though we are saying, oh, we are very clever. You see, inside this body, etc., comes with a package, with a baggage. We're always fearful. So Abhaya Mudra says, come near. This fear that you have, fear of life itself, fear of your routine everywhere, I will demolish that forever. Abhaya Mudra, your fear will be demolished forever. Imagine, suppose we lived in a stage. You know, half our life we live shuddering. We offended that person at work. This, man, this uh, wife of mine or this husband of mine is not behaving well. We are fearful. We live in a state of fear. And Shiva said, come, I will blow it away forever. Fearlessness. See, one of the things that we need to address in the human condition is the fear, idea of fear. We all suffer from it. We may not admit it. It may be unconscious. But all of our life, we analyze it. We are living in fear. Old age catching up, wrinkles here, oil of yule. You know, we need all 
these things to be sorted out and we are always fighting again. And Shiva says, this Godhead that I am offering removes fear forever, Abhaya Mudra. So you see this imagery, in a way this answers both your questions, saying that, look, we can only do so much and we can continue to do so much until the thirst comes from within, not to just believe in God but to experience God, unless it begins to bubble up from within. When we begin to see the, if you like, the, 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 the futility of this life, and you see there's something more underpinning it, I want to touch it. I want to touch base with what is underpinning all this. When the thirst becomes very visible in our lives, we become serious about religion. And that I tell you, once that seriousness becomes visible in our lives, things begin to click together. And religion then no longer is purely a, a belief system. It is an experiential aspect of our lives. In fact, I've been telling this again and again, and I'm sending this message back again to India. You see, because Hinduism is so open-minded, it allows variety of different prophets and proponents of religion, it pays a price. Because the field is crowded by so many people, making so many claims, you don't know where to look. So the Hindu religion said, watch it. When a person is talking about religion or spirituality from experience, and you are convinced about it, he may claim it, but he may be just a charlatan. But if he, if he is able to convince you that he is talking about religion from experience, he is your guide. Because you've got, the, you, you've got a guide who is, who is not blind anymore. He has seen God. So he use a, you choose a guide very carefully. Now why am I saying this? I've been challenged many a times because I go and rattle so many systems all over the country. I said, what is your authority to talk about Hinduism? I say, look, I don't have any authority, but the guide I am using is an authoritative figure recognized by the, the whole Hindu community. And that guide is Vivekananda. He spoke about religion, spirituality from experience. When he talked about Atman or Brahman, at a drop of a hat, with a click of a finger, he could go into the deepest state of meditation where he loses body consciousness and is one with the spirit. He knows I am that. He's able to do that at a, at a click of a finger, any stage, any time. That well established in God realization. When I look at his life, it reflects that. He, nothing else would, 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 would sway him. This idea of God experience and being established in God experience and trying to, you see, this God experience comes with such force, it will flow out of his life and his teachings and enter society, the greater society. And that is visible in his life and teachings. At the end of last century, I think the Times of India did a survey about the spiritual light of India in the last century. And, this, and the whole of Hindu community voted. And the overwhelming winner was not Gandhi, you might think maybe Gandhi, was Vivekananda. Because Vivekananda talks about God, spirituality, religion from experience. Once you are tapped in, once you are plugged in, spirituality flows out of you and affects everybody who comes around you. They are all gone because they know this guy is talking from experience and they come with tremendous force. So this one man, Stop, if you like, huge conversion ploy at that time to convert the whole of the Hindu community to Christianity. This one man managed to put a stop to it. One man. That much power he came. Again, it is this one man who inspired thousands and thousands of people to do social service for the, for the, for the downtrodden Hindus. He gave Hinduism its own dignity. He gave the Hindu people dignity. So one man. All the social reform that took place in the last century, if you look at who inspired, like Gandhi, for example. Gandhi said very clearly, after studying Vivekananda, the love I had for my country was increased thousandfold. See? Acknowledged. So, always, when you are serious about religion, suppose you say, I want religion to be experiential. The first rule is, go to somebody who is experienced. That's a minimum requirement, minimum. But that doesn't guarantee that the spiritual experience will come to you, but at least you are at least on safe grounds. You are looking in the right direction. Because the majority of Hindus failed in the first test. They are easily taken in by the Rasmatas. They lose their way. You see, you go to the, the, if you like, the heart of the matter. Go to the, 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 if you like, the spiritual fountainhead of your religion where it's flowing. Not in ancient times, in modern times. Relate to them. You catch it. You'll catch the flow. But the first thing is look in the right direction. And we sometimes forget to do that. So just in the first session, we just developed this idea of God as a personality. And we also touched on the idea of God as a principle. 
it is very crucial to be aware of both the approaches in Hinduism to get a broad vision of Hinduism. Because if you are just fixated on the idea of God as a super personality, as Ram or Krishna or Shiva or Mother Goddess or as Vishnu, you see you have a very limited exposure to the broad ideas within Hinduism. Hinduism allows us to relate to the idea of God as a super personality, it is not apologetic about it at all. And as I said in the first session, in a way we produce a mold which is filled by a something great and grand called the spirit, which fills the mold and makes the mold come alive. So it is no longer imagination, we actually experience God as a super personality in front of us. So God can be experiential in a very personalized manner, in a very personal manner. Some other religions have difficulty with the idea of God as a person that you can experience, because they say you can never experience God. You just have to die and go in heaven and you get his experience or you get his feeling that is there. But Hindu religions say, no, no, if you are human, you can relate to the idea of God as a super personality and he will come and play with you here and now. It is a very, very exciting idea. Because now it is not just a matter of belief in the hereafter, it is something to catch hold of here and now. Religions become relevant for us here and now, not in the hereafter. Now this idea has become also visible, say in the some of the other Indic religions like say Buddhism and Jainism. This idea of God not necessarily just as a super personality, but as a principle. In fact, the two religions that come out of Hinduism, that is what the Hindus would claim, the, Buddhist, the Buddhism and Jainism are actually focusing on the idea of the spirit, not as a personality. This is a unique contribution to the whole dialogue. This second approach, why is the second approach more endearing? Because to a great extent it, it resolves serious philosophic challenges in a rational format. Let me give an example. In the first session I said, you see, these human features we hear about say, being compassionate, being knowing, being powerful, we relate to them very well. And we like to exaggerate these feelings in our own lives and we do this by this idea of a super personality who is all powerful, all knowing. So we raise our level to reach him. In the process we are kind of this thing that we like, become more visible in our lives and become truly religious. So far so good. We use this idea of a super personality to become spiritual ourselves, becoming religious in true sense ourselves, being compassionate, being knowledgeable, being powerful. You see this idea of empowering mankind is central in religions. But it comes with a flow, a logical flow. You say, what logical flow? Sounds so straightforward. There is a logical flow. Because when you look around and you see all around you so much suffering, forget about the suffering in our own private lives that we all have. You know, each and every one, if you analyze each and every one of us here, we will find we are really burdened with so many problems. There is so much suffering at so many different levels. There is no end to it. We all struggle, we are all kind of burdened by them. We know, we, we struggle. But not just us, the whole of the living kingdom, look around. It is frightening. Forget about the human kingdom. If you look at the animal kingdom, the amount of suffering is much more horrendous and there is no way out for them. They are stuck. You see, again I have said this before, I am going to say it again because it is so crucial. The level of pain an animal would feel, suppose you cut an animal, the amount of pain the animal would feel would be far greater, far deeper, far higher than a human person can feel. Because they live with this level of senses. All their senses are highly accentuated, they are very, you know, kind of very vibrant. So they will feel the pain much more than us. So you have to explain now, okay, there is an almighty God who created this empire, marvelous idea, we played along with you and we flowed along with you and it seems all right. But we will get a question, a philosophic challenge. What about all this? What kind of a world is he created? It is almost monstrous. One of the critiques of religion, I think Locke, said that if you say there is an almighty God who is in charge of this creation, who has created this world, then I would say he is a monster, he is an evil person. You say, oh, to call God evil, this is a horrible man. But the man is just using his common sense and saying, look, when I look at the, the, the blood and bloodshed in the animal kingdom, you see every animal lives of another animal. They are biting, chewing each other while they are alive. And they are feeling more pain than human beings would feel on the physical level. So what God set this into motion? This God must be almost a monster. 
So the idea of God comes with, if you like, the idea of a super personality, God comes with serious baggage. And when we ask, the Hindus will give answer, oh, don't argue, this is called Leela, God's play, he's playing. Now you see, if you absolve him, because he says he's God alone who's taking all these human forms, animal forms, and he's messing around like this. So he's paying a price for his own play. He's suffering. That's the way we get around this argument. But you see, as a sober, rational person, it doesn't, I mean, I find it offensive. I see it as a cop-out, not really responding to a challenge. So the resolution lies in saying that this idea of a super personality looking over us was perhaps not right. It was useful, but philosophically it can be challenged. And we are just challenged it, saying, what kind of a God created this world? Monster. So this challenge that comes facing us, we can't run away from it, can be better addressed when you think of God not as a personality, but as a principle. Because you can't hold him responsible now, you see? He's not like a person anymore. He's just a principle. You see, how can you absolve something by just calling it a principle? Let me just show you a simple example. Deliberately, I make a silly example. Suppose all human beings look, mm, so we look at the world, we like to make sense of the world, this is called dharma, marvelous enterprise. Now while we are making sense of the world, we observe this thing called gravitation, whereby things are held down to earth. We say, what a marvelous thing, this gravitation. Because of gravitation, we are, we are, our, our feet are on the ground, others will be floating off in space, all of us. Thank God for gravitation. Because of gravitation, we can sit, stand on the floor, walk, the plants grow, everything falls, the apple falls down as Newton discovered, things are working well. Thank God for gravitation. And we might decide to call gravitation the God of gravitation. Because of it, human beings can survive on this earth. What a marvelous God called gravitation. Because of it, all of us can walk about, jump about, you know, plant food and live happily ever after. What a marvelous God. Now things are going fine until I go out for a walk with my best friend. And while we are walking, my best friend is a few feet ahead of me and a huge boulder falls from the mountain nearby and, thump, and falls on top of my friend and kills him. I go, ah, the god of gravitation killed my brother, my friend. Horrible god. But you see, what will gravitation say? This is how the cookie crumbles. The same thing that is holding you down is bringing the, the rock onto the, your friend too. You can't have it both ways. See, because when you turn into a principle, you can't hold him responsible. This is how the lovely English word is, the lovely English phrase is, this is how the cookie crumbles. So when you want a gravitation to be good, fine, but then this gravitation will also thump. So in a way, by making it impersonal, you take away this pointed challenge at religion. That is why the idea of person, not a personality, but a principle underpinning reality is philosophically sound. Also the idea of, the foundation of, like as I said in the last session, the foundation of ethics and morality on the idea that the same principle that percolates through this body and mind, the spirit that appears and looks out through here, appears and looks out through those eyes. So my moral foundation of why I should look after him, why shouldn't hit him, why should I look after rather than kill somebody, is because I'm linked with that person. So it gives a solid foundation, much more direct reason for being good to others and not hurting somebody else. When you have a theistic approach, a super personality, then you say, the reason why I have to don't hit him is because God is looking over my shoulder, keeping records. And that God will be very busy. The millions of us are doing all sorts of things every minute. So it seems kind of really outlandish. But this idea of a God as a principle removes that requirement. He doesn't have to look over my shoulder. This is how we are linked with each other, so we are stuck with each other, so we have to look after each other. We can't thump each other. And again, the way we do it has to be contextual, you know, in some, some cases I may have to thump him back, but he'll thump me or something like that. So it's contextual. We recognize it. And then we can deal with it. It's a very mature way of looking at serious ethical and moral issues. This idea of God, not as a personality, but as a principle. And do you know how it becomes visible? You see, Jainism and Buddhism are perhaps ahead of their times. That's why I find them highly enduring, very lovely religions. Because they both have managed to get around the idea of God. They do not invoke God, they invoke principles. So what does Buddha say? Buddha says, look, I'm not searching for a God, 
In fact, let me just say why Buddha was very put off by Hindus or Hinduism of his time. He observed two things that were getting in the way. In the name of religion, so much bloodshed was being carried out in his time. You know what they used to do? They used to sacrifice large number of animals to appease the gods in the heavens. They were slaughtering animals, thousands of them. The more animals you slaughter, the higher the rewards in heaven for you. This was the religion of India in, those, in his time. It was obnoxious. Imagine bloodthirsty religion like that. And even you see in, the, in some of the Vedic script, there's a, even mention of, of human sacrifice. You know that? He said, oh, that's not Veda. Oh, that's there. Watch it. So Buddha saw that he said, I better put everything under the carpet and shove it aside and re present religion in a different mold. In a different mold. And that's what he did. He had to step away from this kind of Brahmanical tyranny. Tyranny. Because they, were, they said, okay, unless you do the sacrifice exactly as I prescribe, and unless you uh, invite me to, do, to, to recite the slokas exactly with the right pronunciation, it will produce a negative result, counterproductive result. So you, you do yagna and you invite me and I'll do this ceremony for you. And unless you let, invite me, you are in trouble because somebody else will mispronounce. Oh dear, oh dear. So all these animal sacrifice vested. I must be invited. This is called Brahmanical tyranny. You may think India has walked away, we have become mature. We are not mature. We still have those guys who continue to say, oh, it's written in the scripture. You have to do this, recite this hundred times. You have to do this hundred Wow. Oh, this is liturgy. Grow out. These are externals for a religion. And yet we are stuck with this. And many people who left Hindus, who left the Hindu fold and took other religions because they got fed up with this, this Brahmanical tyranny. It is visible in modern India. It is visible in modern United Kingdom. And I'm fighting it. So you see, this idea, the reason why Buddha moved away from this idea of this super personality and all the scriptures, he said, leave it aside. Let's start again. Start fresh. And his whole idea, his whole philosophy was basically this. Discovering spirituality in a non-theistic mode without reference to a god. And this is what is achieved in Buddhist tradition. It is perhaps the most pragmatic practical world religion. In fact, the reason why the Westerners find Buddhism so attractive is because there is no God, thankfully. They had enough of God. This is better to relate to religion in a non-God, in a godless manner. You see, this is also visible in the non-theistic Hindu tradition. That's what I'm telling you. This idea of Atman and Brahman are non-theistic Hindu approaches. You are essentially, your essential nature is what you are discovering and calling as God, is your own essential nature. Recognize, touch base with it, that is religion. So this, I feel like this kind of nice cohesion between the Buddhist approach and the non-theistic Hindu approach is very, very endearing and very suited to the modern age. Because the modern youth will relate to this idea much more easily. It sounds more endearing, that there is something unique about us, we are just invoking that, and that's called religion. Hmm, no God involved. Good for it. <clears throat> now for your AS level, etc., there is a question that's going to arise which is saying, how does Hinduism relate to other religions? Or the concept of God in Hinduism relate to the concept of God in other religions? This is now the new syllabus. So how would you relate? You say, Hinduism with its very open pluralistic approach allows variety of different ways to relate to the idea of spirituality. It allows for a monotheistic approach relating to a monotheist, a super personality called God. It allows for that. It recognizes its limitation, but it says, look, if it satisfies you, this is how you want to become spiritual by relating to Vishnu or Shiva or Mother Goddess or Ram or Krishna. Go for it, my friend. Recognize its limitation. See the scope of your enterprise and also recognize where, you st where your limitation comes. So when philosophic challenges come, you will, you're going to hit your limitation. Be ready for that. But it ap appeals to you. That's your pathway. Suppose you're more esoteric Hindu and you prefer this kind of non-theistic approach. Seeing and serving God in man is a way of saying non-theistic Hinduism. Not God in the heaven. Seeing and serving God in man. You see, seeing Shiva in Jiva and serving Jiva as Shiva is the idea of non-theistic. See, I'm using the word Shiva still, and yet I'm saying spirit is this non-theistic Hinduism. And this is very lovely material. It relates well with Buddhism, Jainism, almost parallel. There is no distinction. 
So when you look at, say, concept of God in Hinduism and concept of God in other religions, this is what you say. You say the theistic approach, the monotheistic approach relates extremely well, say, with the other monotheist religions of the other, reli of the, of the other worlds, world religions, like, say, Christianity, Islam, and Judaism. We see this resonance. The only place where we part company, say, with the monotheist religions of, say, the Abrahamic traditions is they have got an exclusivist angle. They say only our way of thinking about God and approaching God is right, the rest of you are doomed. There the Hindus will part company and say, no, we are pluralistic. And within Hinduism, we already recognize a variation of approaches, variation of Godheads. So in the same way, we can extend our idea to say, you can also be religious by thinking of God as Jesus. Fine, that's your way, go for it. You will think of God this, at this way, Abrahamic way, that's fine. So we relate well, except we challenge the exclusivist ideology of the Abrahamic religion. But otherwise, we have no difficulty. So you must recognize the parallel and the point of departure, saying this part we disagree with you. And this idea of challenging exclusivism is so crucial. Otherwise, we have fighting in the name of religion, even within the Abrahamic religion, because there are three of them saying, we alone have the right path, the rest of you are wrong. And within, even, even say, within Christianity, you've got these 190 denominations, and there are some which will say, the oh, rest of you are wrong. Even Catholic religion will say, the Anglicans are wrong. So they can't even sit with each other, because this exclusive strand does not allow them to sit well with people of their own religion, forget about people of other religion. While the pluralistic idea of Hindus is such a powerful thought, such a powerful prescription of not allowing different Hindu approaches to sit side by side, but to allow for Hindu approaches to sit well with the Christian or the Muslim approaches. We don't feel worried. We say, this is the way you like to think of God, go for it, pluralism. So exclusive agenda have to be addressed. This is the inclusivist nature of the Hindu religion. So we relate to the other monotheist religion, and we also relate well with the non-theistic religion like Buddhism and Jainism. Because we say this is similar to the esoteric ideas of Atman and Brahman in the Hindu religion. So it's nice to see these linkages and also a point of, point of departure. <coughs> Can I? I think the, the question of suffering is a very important one. I mean, uh, it's very difficult to reconcile the idea of uh, God and suffering. Uh, the question is that how does Hinduism see suffering as a very root? Why in the first place have a seed called suffering? Because that, that itself doesn't really make sense. And it's very hard to explain. Also, you explain the idea of how suffering relates to the idea in a theistic mode, Leela. Can you explain how do you see in a theistic mode as well? Yeah. You see, when you want to ask this kind of very difficult, very pointed question of God, saying, why suffering? Let me fall back on our mentors, my mentor, who, from whom I have picked up the ideas of religion, Sri Ramakrishna. And people say, Ramakrishna, you see the mother goddess all the time. So this problem, suffering all around us, ask her why did she set up this kind of a world where there's so much suffering? And his answer was equally, you know, he was like that. He said, go and ask her yourself. <laughs> not a serious issue. The serious issue is this. He was not trying to make light of a very serious question. Because the question would appear, why is he fobbing me off? He should say, I will ask Mother Goddess for you and give an answer. The answer, what he is trying to say is this. When you have God experience, somehow this whole issue appears irrelevant. You go, ha ha, like that. All this thing falls away. So the idea of suffering doesn't even arise. You can't ask her. This is what he's saying. Because you are so thrilled by her that all these appears, questions appear like, you know, uh, irrelevant. Let me give you a little funny story. A person used to have trouble in his dreams. He used to struggle. Every time you get up waking, sweating, he went to a psychologist. He said, I've got a problem. Every time I close my eyes, I go into a dream, and I see a door. And I push and I push. Because then the psychology, you know, you say, door, you want to get through it. I say, I push and I push and I push, and nothing happens. And I get up sweating. The door doesn't budge. And I'm very worried. What does it signify? The psychologist said, OK. Next time have a dream, come back afterwards. Observe everything carefully. Again, he had a dream, door appeared, he pushed, pushed, and nothing happened. He was frustrated. He woke up sweating and ran to the psychologist saying, same. Psychologist, mm, okay, now explain to me exactly what the dream. Now, what, was there anything written on the door? He said, yes, he said, pull. <laughs> <laughs> See, you solve your problem. Now, I'm making a light of a very serious question. This is what Ramakrishna is saying. What appears as a very pointed, tricky thing for us here appears as nothing in that God experience. 
there it seems to resolve itself without any challenging, without any debate. So it's, it's still a, it's still a, you can be critical and say it's still a, you know, it's a, it's a cop out. You're saying, what are you saying? Find God and you'll answer, the question will be answered only when you find God, not before. That's what he's saying. Until that time, it will continue to prod you. So in fact, in our, philo in our, in our, in our textbook, we have said this. We said the only endearing aspect of suffering is it keeps prodding us, saying something is not right here. It will force you to find God because suffering has not been sorted out for you. Forget about the whole world. Because it keeps prodding you, keeps pinching you on the side. You say, I must resolve this issue of suffering. And just the, the idea of resolving suffering will lead you to God. That's what he's telling you. So the only good thing about suffering, if I can say the word good about suffering, is that it will, it will push you towards God. You know, the only way to resolve the issue of suffering is to actually experience God. This is the answer from the people who are good experienced, God realized. Again, you see, this is still a, you can claim this to be a, you can claim this to be a cop out. So the word Leela, you know, I mean, I can say it's Leela, God is playing. Suppose I meet a widow who has just lost a son who is crying. And I go and tell her, mother, don't worry, this is Leela. I'm guaranteeing you she will slap me. And I should be ready for it because that's part of the Leela too. <laughs> We'll smack you because this, you know, she's burning inside and you say, Leela, play, this is a play, my son died, this is calling it a play, I'll whack you. And you must accept it as part of the play too. But you see, this is what Leela will do. It is still perhaps not so. So the theistic approach or the theistic word Leela, you know, fulfills a little bit of function, not full. But the second approach that you just suggested, Vijabai, is the, the non-theistic response to the issue of suffering. It says, Really speaking, didn't I use the word? The spirit manifests itself or appears as or projects itself as the universe. So the tricky word is it appears or projects. It is not true. This is what he's saying. So the word that we use to explain this philosophic idea is the word the Hindus devised, very powerful word, maya. So in the world of appearance, there is pleasure and there is pain. In reality, what you are truly about, neither of these things can affect you. But you say, nobody's affecting me now. Oh, but that's in the, in the plane of Maya. So they get away. See, so you still see uh, people who are going to be challenging will say, this is still, you know, you're walking out. You're not really, you are, you know, finding a way out, way around this. And you're not really addressing the issue. Why this? You see, there is one place where Swami Vivekananda said, which, which of course is uh, very, uh, very lovely. Swami Vivekananda said, when I look at the world, look at the, the, this guy, he's really quite arrogant. He says, if I look at the world, I think I could have done a better job. There'll be less suffering. I mean, this is terrible. The only way, perhaps, we can explain this idea of suffering, unwanted suffering, is this. It says, it is in the undue rush for very fast evolution that living things step on each other. So imagine there's a gush of life coming out, gush, life gushing forth. But because there is this tremendous rush for evolution, you want to do it very fast, we step on each other's toes. And that is what creates suffering, in the, especially in the animal kingdom. Now let me explain. It's a lovely idea. Suppose the world was only plants. You see, if you look at all the living kingdom, plants are very special, very unique. Why? They don't live off other living things. They look at the air, you know, they take thing, carbon dioxide from the air, water from the ground. They're not living on other living things, hopefully not. Some might, eh? some plants are quite vicious. But majority of them live peacefully, just living off chemicals, not stepping onto each other's toes. Lovely chaps. In fact, if you want to revere living things, I think plants should be the one to be revered the most. They're least offensive. So you see, if evolution was just at the level of the plants, you know, slow evolution, take your time, you know, another 10 billion years, what's the rush? If the evolu process of evolution had been perhaps slower or more gradual, perhaps we would be less stepping on each other and perhaps animals will not be tearing each other apart. We, in fact, human beings, we might be learning to live on chemicals, you know, when they go on the moon, they use these chemicals. In days to come, we may not even have to live, forget about living on animal life or eating meat. You may not have to even plant life even. That's horrible. How dare you crunch and munch this lovely apple? It's somebody's baby. You don't eat that. So you might say, oh, this is horrible. Even the vegetarian, you see, we are still living for the living things. So this idea that if the process of evolution had been slower, perhaps, we may have not had this rush. It's the rush of, this is Swami Vivekananda's words, the rush of evolution where we step on each other. And this is creating friction in the living kingdom. So this is a, a nice, endearing way 
Or still the problem does not go away, but the problem goes away only with Ramakrishna's solution. Find God and it will not appear anymore. Until that time, it will prod you to find God. So the only good thing about suffering is it will make you suffer so much that you will say, hey God, I'm squeaking here now, let me get to you and sort my suffering out. This is a, it's still a cop-out, philosophically cop-out, but we recognize it and we say, this is the best we can do. <clears throat> very good question, sir. One question that has a reason and is quite very pointed is this. People say, you know, Mr. Lakan, your religion is weird. You know, for example, uh, in some of the temples, there are very erotic figures outside, erotic figures. You know, Kajurao, uh, Konarak temples, the imagery, if you look on the outside temple, actually I didn't realize before I had my mother on a pilgrimage with me. And we came near the temple wall. I said, Mother, you sit under the tree, under the shed. I couldn't take her near. It was so horrendous, obnoxious. They say, how can Hinduism allow that? And then they say, ah, the Hindus worship the phallic symbol, a male organ as the Shiva Ling. I said, oh my God, this is getting really weirder. I said, ask any Hindu who has come out of a Shiva temple, did you worship, oh, linga, oh, the male organ, we are worshipping, do they do that? No. The word linga itself, Sanskrit translation is symbol. The word doesn't mean male organ, it means a symbol. It has been used as that, but it actually means a symbol. So we are saying, this is one of the symbols we use to relate to the idea of the spirit, this idea of God as Shiva. Now, how could, have, could it have started? I'm, I think hard about these kind of things. You see, we have this habit in the Hindu tradition of worshipping even natural objects that remind us of higher things. If, for example, you are a Vaishnavite devout devotee, you look at the Shaligram, you know, that's just a rounded stone. And they say, this is Vishnu. This is not Vishnu, it's a rounded stone. No, this is Vishnu. We get fixated and we love that. So we get that thing and we use it and we use it for worship. They use that image, that, that, that rounded stone as Shaligram and we'll worship it day and night in the homes. In the same way, in a very natural mode, I suspect. In the ancient time, the meditation was always taking place in the caves. And we have these this stalactites and stalagmites coming out naturally in caves. A mold coming out of the ground. They say this is a very good manifest. Something is manifesting from underpinning. Something from underneath comes out and produces this mold like this, mound if you like. And this is a natural expression of, if you like, this idea of spirit bubbling up and manifesting as this universe, marvelous symbol. This is how I suspect the Shiva Linga became, if you like, a, f a figure of appreciation. This is where the background is. But in the medieval period, a lot of nonsense was paraded and became part of Hindu tradition. And during that period, they may have misused this to mean a male organ. But modern Hindu, if you tell them you are worshiping, it's a go away. He'll, he'll, he'll hit you. He'll be very annoyed if you tell a Shiva devotee. So this purely, I think, is purely a natural thing that we observed, in, uh, a natural phenomena we observed in nature. I mean, it's, so this is a marvelous way of relating to the idea of something underpinning becoming manifested in the universe as something that's coming out of the ground. And this is the background, I think, to the idea of linga, symbol of God. Linga means a symbol, not an organ. It's important that we creation sort of idea I want to obviously sort of know more about at least sort of uh, there is a scientific way of Darwin's theory about talking about creation and obviously religions obviously have their own theories at least where does Hinduism come from actually could you please say? Marvelous. First of all by definition Hinduism is defined as dharma which means making sense of the world that we live in discerning the laws that dictate the nature that the world that we see in front of us discerning the laws and harness them for our betterment this is the way we define religion. Dharma means, what are the laws, laws that dictate the world? I want to understand them and harness them for my benefit. So, by definition, Hinduism can never disagree with the findings of science. Can never disagree. They have to, go, they have, they have to be pulled by the nose. They have to agree. So, the idea of evolution, etc., does not bother. In fact, we are very comf comfortable with the idea of evolution, that we came out of the animal kingdom. It is very, very clear in our, tra our tradition that we come out from the, this kind of you know, the animal kingdom and plant kingdom and evolution, we agree. There's no problem. We may disagree with some of the conclusion they might come up with. You see, this is one thing to say the findings of science. The second thing to say this is the conclusion of science now. We may disagree with some of the conclusion, but not with the findings of science. So we have no difficulty with evolution. What about the whole of this creation? How did it all start? A very interesting thing to examine. 
If you are from the theistic mode, say monotheist religion or monotheistic tradition in, within Hinduism, then suppose you are a Vaishnavite, you say, hmm, you see Vishnu was lying in the bed of ocean and then from his belly button came out a lotus and in the lotus was sitting Brahma. Now, I don't know if the people who wrote this stuff were trying to say something very poor about Brahma because things that come out of belly buttons are not very wholesome normally. I'm just making light comment. I hope don't offend anybody. So, this idea of Brahma in the lotus that came out of Vishnu's belly button and then Vishnu said, Brahma, sort out the world, create the universe, you know, because I am the supreme God. Brahma said, of course, Maharaj, I will create the world. So, this is, if you like, a Vaishnavite way of explaining the creation. See, the, again, Vishnu is the Godhead. Even though Brahma is there, Vishnu is the one who gives the order. He comes out of Vishnu. Okay, one monotheist. Suppose you are from the Abrahamic religion. There they say, here is Almighty God. <clears throat> he said, okay, I need to create. So in six days, he's a clink, click, click his fingers, and the whole world came into being. The seventh day, he rested. In six days, sorted everything out. First day, this happened. Second day, this happened. They give you a... Now, you see, when we compare this with, say, the findings of modern cosmology, modern science, we are immediately at loggerheads. We seem to be at, you know, on a crash course. How can you reconcile this with what modern science is telling us? What does modern science tell us? We must understand that. The modern theory, modern cosmology is very well established, well, you know, well founded, well researched. Says that the whole of this creation that we see around us, all these galaxies, all the stars and the moons and the planets, all of these were created about 13.7 billion years ago. They are giving dates. Again, rough, but it's pretty good. 13.7 billion years ago, there was a big bang when the universe unfolded and everything came about. If you say, was there somebody who set it off into motion? They say, no, no, no need for anybody. Just spontaneous. How, where, we don't know, but this is how it, we have got very clear science. How do they know this? When they study the galaxies, the galaxies are moving away from each other at a particular speed. And they say, ah, now we can go, you know, extrapolate and imagine this going backwards in time. So how far backward will it go before it just becomes one point? They say, ah, 13.7 billion years ago. This is how they get the time. It's so very well researched, well founded, good scientific theory, Big Bang theory is central. So how do, I mean, the theistic mode will, you know, where was Vishnu sitting around before this Big Bang? And where did he start the Big Bang? Why did he start the, and where did Brahma come in? So, see, Difficulty or the idea of the Abrahamic idea of six day God create the world in six days doesn't go anywhere near 13.7 billion years ago. Six days, nowhere near six, 13.7 billion years in six days. How do you reconcile? Difficulty. What does non theistic Hinduism say? So, for that, we go to the Nasadiya Sukta of the Rig Veda. You see, we, we have thought about all these things very well. Here we see dramatically ma dramatic material that sits well with findings of modern science. Not at logarithms, but very comfortable with the idea of modern cosmology. It is, this is what it says. It says, really speaking, the whole of this creation, if you like, is an unfolding. And this is, if you like, interpretation of my mentor, Swami Vivekananda, in his talks in 1896. He said, the way this, we look at this creation is that there are three things through which the creation takes into be becomes into being. The absolute becomes manifested. This thing that is absolute Brahman becomes manifested, but it uses three ploys. This is Swami Vivekananda, 1896 lecture, before modern cosmology, recorded in London. Three things. This is a lovely thing. The, 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 the talk was called Absolute and Manifestation. So it was talk called like that. He said, the three things, the three dimensions through which this absolute becomes relative or manifested is R. Look at the language. Space, time, causation, desh, kar, nimit. No personal God setting into motion the world. These three unfolded, space, time and causation, and brought about this creation in front of us. How well does it relate to modern cosmology? You'll be, you'll be shocked and amazed. Modern cosmology says, this is the theory of Big Bang. This creation that we see in front of us began because before you say, was there anything before the Big Bang? They said, don't ask because there was no time. Where did it begin? There was nowhere. There was no space. There was no time. Don't even ask question where it began and when it began. So at that particular juncture, they say, when space and time unfolded, this is modern cosmology, when space and time unfolded, unfold, 
creation came into being. Space and time were the first things to unfold. And it happened spontaneously. There was no God even. This is modern cosmology. The only place where Swami can press wins, marks, scores points is that it says not only space and time that unfolded, causation too unfolded. Causation, the idea of cause and effect came after Big Bang, not before. So in, in this particular interpretation, you can't even ask the question, who caused the Big Bang? Who put the button? pull the button, who press the button for space and time to unfold. Don't even ask that question because the idea that somebody has to cause it was not even there. Causation too came into being. Space, time and causation unfolded for the universe to come into being. See, compared with modern cosmology, sits extremely well. So the idea of evolution, the theory of uh, Big Bang, creation of the whole system, the universe, sits very well with non-theistic Hinduism. Not Vishnu clicking his finger, but this idea that they spontaneously unfolded. And the lovely part of the Nasadiya Sukta, the last phrase of the Nasadiya Sukta does it justice. It's, it wants to go about the idea of a personal God. Do you know how it finishes Nasadiya Sukta? He say, it says, he in the highest heaven, is there addressing God? This Veda is addressing he in the highest heaven, perhaps knows how it unfolds or how he does it. Perhaps he does not know. That means God came afterwards. This unfolding came first, and then the concept of God came after. See the bravery, see the breadth of vision of this religion. It's so brave to say, put God on the shelf, saying, perhaps he knows how this thing started, perhaps he doesn't know. He's like us, secondary. See the power of this religion. He's not frightened of these kind of philosophic challenges. And anybody who has studied the Nasadiya Sukta, I'm talking about Western philosophers, Western poets, say this is perhaps one of the most grandest poetic gesture of spirituality the world has ever seen. It is very open, very philosophically challenging, and such depth of understanding, even challenging the presence of God in the, in the Rig Veda and the Nasadiya Sukta, very visible. And this makes it grand. It's prepared to take on the challenge of rationality head on. It is not frightened of rationality. It, it thrives on it. And through this rational challenging of how did the whole creation come into being, we see religion in a much deeper light, in a much more broader light. That is what we are, we are very keen on, seeing this world in its kind of true pristine color, what it truly is rather than what we think it is. See, dig deeper into the nature of reality. That is what religion is about.